Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to a special distinguished speaker session at the 2013 School Leadership Summit. Keith Kruger is here. Keith, welcome. Hey, Steve. Really nice to have you here. Keith is my former employer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. I think I worked for you. Uh, that's kind of a big stretch. Thanks to <laughs> Keith Cal for helping to sponsor the conference. Thanks to Wilson Consulting, the Asia Society, and Intel. Their support is most appreciated. This is a chance for those of you who are in our studio lanes to indicate where you're listening from. Look for the star icon to the left of the map. It's the second one down. Click on it twice and then click on the map. And it's fun if you put in the chat. Oh, we have time. Someone from Australia. I'm in. Baron. That's actually <laughs> me. It's four in the morning in Baron Buda, Australia, between Sydney and Melbourne. Oh, my. <laughs> You're dedicated, Steve. <laughs> this has been fun. Thanks for being here. Thanks to those of you who are listening to the recording. Keith, I'm going to turn the time over to you. If you need any help, just let me know. Thanks for being here. Okay. Great to be here today, and thanks again, Steve, for uh, all of your hard work, and thanks to TCAL for uh, doing this Leadership uh, Virtual Summit. Um, what I want to do today is just uh, give a brief sort of overview. Uh, I imagine that many of the people on today's webinar have gone through strategic planning, and the typical task that you are given is what's the big hairy problem that you're not thinking about that you should be. Uh, and so today's uh, conversation I wanted to frame around that sort of strategic perspective of, you know, what are the big hairy problems about technology uh, in K-12? And for those of you who are not familiar with uh, my organization. I run uh, the Consortium for School Networking. We're a, a U.S. Uh, North American focused uh, uh, national association focused on uh, the folks in charge of technology in our school systems. Uh, the chief, what we generically call chief technology officers. And we've been around for 20 years. And uh, we really try to empower educational leaders to use uh, technology in a transformative way. And um, OK, the slides seem to be in a, a different order than what I'm uh, hold on. I think I'm not seeing them so correctly. If the slides are out of order. Then oh, they are. Let me. Uh, why don't you just talk for thirty seconds, and I'll get them in the right order. Okay. All right. Uh, w well, um, what I I think we really are, are going to talk about are the two big problems of of, uh, of technology, and the first is um, th that. Uh, we have a problem around ubiquity and access, uh, and there are big gaps in that area. And uh, then I'm going to talk about uh, the, the bigger, even more hairy problem, and that is uh, human capacity. Let me see if you've gotten your slides back up to there. Um, oh, we're on to, we're <laughs> we've zoomed to the finish. I, I need another 30 seconds. That okay, that's fine. Hang on. Uh, so when we uh, talk about uh, ubiquity, uh, by that we mean uh, does every person sort of have access uh, to a device, and uh, do they have increasingly broadband access? And um, this, these are uh, uh, not. Uh, 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 bound problems uh, that just happen in the United States or just happen in other countries. It is really a global uh, challenge, and so I'm pleased to say to see today that we have um, folks from different parts of the world participating. 
If there's some okay. glitch in Blackboard Collaborate that's not importing the slides in the right order, uh, okay. I'm going to get the first five in the right okay. place for you, and then I'm going to try and keep up, so give me just a second. Okay. Well, one of the, the things that I always like to start off with before uh, getting into the heart of the matter is, you know, why is this important? Why is technology, why is education important? And um, one of the slides that you'll eventually see uh, is, in fact, uh, the data around uh, the importance of education and economic growth. Uh, I know in the United States we have we've had kind of a sluggish economy, if not a if not worse, uh, over the last few year, few years. And uh, there's an interesting study by McKinsey, who found that an improvement of one standard deviation in the PISA scores. Uh, results in an additional 2% GDP growth. And what we really want to get to is uh, that sort of continuous improvement and that education is really the fuel for our economy. And how are we doing, Steve? Oh, okay. It looks like you've got the first few slides. So this was, as I said, the, the uh, two big things we're going to talk about today. And here is, in fact, the link that I was talking about, the uh, specific study uh, indicating kind of the uh, importance of education to economic growth. So this is not a, a small topic. This is a big problem. And uh, when we're talking about technology, I think it's important the, the next slide uh, shows an annual report that we do along with the New Media Consortium and ISTE, and it looks at emerging technologies in the K-12 space. They've actually been doing a, the, the first, the, the higher ed version of the Horizon report for over a decade, and about four years ago, uh, they started collaborating with COSIN to create a K-12 version. And the reason I show this is to say that, in fact, there is a lot of innovation that happens in K-12. These are some of the key trends for this past year. They look, the reason it's called a horizon report is it looks in three horizons. The horizon of this year or less, in other words, the, the big technologies that are happening right now, those technologies in the two to three year time frame, and looking out a bit more predictively, uh, in the four to five year horizon. And you can see that uh, mobiles for the second year in a row, and this year they added uh, mobiles and apps as the title, uh, as well as tablet computing, uh, were the top two trends uh, in K-12 uh, for this, uh, this report. Uh, it's built by a group of uh, about 50, 60 global uh, educators, uh, leaders, and uh, it's done in a wiki environment where they vote and they look at uh, uh, trends and try to identify key things that are happening. I put this up simply to this free report and the 2013 report will be coming out uh, in May and June. Uh, the reason I, I put this up is to say there's actually quite a bit that's that's happening, uh, that things are, and these are what these experts identify as the most important trends. So it isn't that there is no uh, innovation happening. I think the folks on the call on the uh, webinar today know that. Um, but when we look over the impact of technology and innovation in K-12, um, the challenge is that it's often really done in, in little islands of innovation. It's done in isolation. It's the, the innovative teacher or the model school. And the problem is, is that we, too, we have too few school systems that are really innovative regardless of what classroom you're in or regardless of what school you go to. And so we want to move away from, we certainly want bubble up uh, innovation by innovative teachers, but we want to move out of a system where it's only the heroes that are, that are innovative and that we uh, move to really an ecosystem that supports and sustains innovation. And um, that's what I want to talk about. That and uh, one of the things that I think is is uh, ch is 
disturbing about education. This is a pretty old survey from a decade ago, but I bet that it probably, uh, it hasn't been replicated, but it probably is true still today. Uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce ranked 55 industry sectors on their use of technology and how intensive it was for the work they do. In fact, uh, education in the U.S. ranked 55 out of 55 sectors ranked at that time. Uh, that was even below uh, areas like coal mining that you wouldn't normally think of as a technology-rich environment. Um, and this, of course, was both higher ed and K-12, and I would argue that K-12 has historically been less IT intensive than higher ed. So um, why hasn't uh, technology kind of transformed education? We've been at this now for uh, some time with the internet, and even before that with personal computers. And I would argue uh, one of the main reasons is that we don't have ubiquity. Um, according to market data retrieval, only 13% of classrooms in the United States have a ubiquitous technology environment, meaning that every student has a device with which to work at. Um, in fact, uh, the U.S. Department of Education would say through their national uh, education statistics that it's about a device for every four or five uh, students, the latest uh, information. Um, the second reason is, is that we've mostly layered technology on top of what we were already doing. Um, that's a good first level uh, of technology, a first phase where we improve uh, the te with technology, we automate things that we were doing, do them in faster, better, cheaper, but it doesn't uh, fundamentally transform the way that we're doing uh, uh, the, the technology. And finally, um, it's really about time, and this isn't unique to K-12, but in fact, uh, technology just takes a while for people who are in that field to really understand how it can be used in new and powerful and transformative ways. So um, there are a variety of different uh, 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 a lot of research that's been done on that, and some uh, say that from the time a technology was invented until it really becomes used in transformative ways takes a number of decades, uh, you know, depending on the, the, the sector. So the question is, how do we kind of move uh, education? And I think it's also interesting to think about how has technology in schools been viewed historically? And I have a couple of examples. Uh, this, even back in 1700, they were concerned about the technology of slates. I'm not going to read the, the, the quote, but you can see that at the teachers' co conference, uh, they were concerned that slates would be dropped and it breaks and then no one would be able to write. Uh, in 1800, the concerns of educators at the Principals Association was that uh, students depend too much on paper. Uh, they don't know how to write on slates. They, they, uh, they can't clean a slate properly. What will they do when paper runs out? Uh, in 1900, the, the, the technology concern was ink. This is uh, from the Teachers Association. Uh, they don't know how to sharpen a pen knife uh, to sharpen a pencil, and that the pen and ink will never replace the pencil. And in the 1950s, getting more into my era, uh, ballpoint pens were, according to uh, a teacher's organization, going to be the ruin of education. So uh, many of the concerns that we hear about technology are not new. Uh, I always uh, like the quote from uh, uh, one of the founders of, of Apple who said, technology is simply something that was invented after you were born. And so um, getting back to the conversation, I think we've been kind of stuck in a pretty old debate. Uh, if we look at how most policymakers or school uh, boards uh, have talked about technology, uh, it's framed in, in answering the question, should we invest in technology and education? Is it uh, going to give us uh, an improvement? And I think that a better way that we need to encourage our 
uh, school leaders and, and po policy makers and the public is the question, what should, should learning really look like today? Um, what does, uh, what is that it that really prepares students for today and tomorrow and makes them college career and life ready? By that, uh, you know, what can we draw from in the way that, that work happens? How can we look at higher education in the way that, that, that students uh, uh, learn? Uh, how is it mobile? Is it, is it uh, uh, 24 by 7? Is it uh, um, allowing you to be self-paced? Um, does it allow you to uh, follow your passions? Does it allow you to be creative and collaborative? Um, all of those sort of questions, I think, are the sorts of things that we need educators and policymakers to be asking. So I said that we were going to talk about the two big problems, and the first problem being ubiquity and access. And uh, as I already pointed out, uh, in the United States, only 13% of classrooms have a one-to-one -one technology environment. Now, there are increasingly exceptions to the rule. Uh, one of the school districts that's highlighted here is Mooresville Graded School District in North Carolina. And the uh, picture there is from the front page of the New York Times a year and a half ago uh, called Mooresville Shining Example, parenthesis, it's not just about the laptops. And uh, well, I think the superintendent and the leadership of Mooresville would quickly say that it, it is not simply about having the technology. However, they would also say that the technology has, in fact, been a catalyst. And there, uh, you can read the improvement that they've seen. They went from a middle of the pack uh, district in North Carolina to now being the second highest in the state in terms of high stakes tests. They've, uh, their graduation rate has gone to the third highest in the state. And the interesting thing is they've done this one to one environment with a district that is in fact relatively poor. In fact, of the 115 North Carolina districts uh, in terms of per pupils expenditure, they are number 100. They've made choices, they've spent their money in different ways to enable a ubiquitous environment with technology. Yet I would say that most of the school district leaders that we've worked with uh, in, at COSIN, and we work with a lot of school districts, uh, even wealthier districts say they can't afford the ongoing cost of providing a device for every student and teacher. Um, I think that something big, the interesting thing is um, if we look at data uh, of what students, what technology students have, they actually uh, have quite a bit of technology. This is from the Pew Internet and American Life Project. And you can see that 86, that um, uh, when, when, students are asked whether or not they can use the technologies of their, their mobile devices, their cell phones, 86% report that they can't use those cell phones in class. They're locked up in their locker, their backpack. Um, only uh, at this time, this is a, a, uh, from March 28th of last year, uh, or March 28th, uh, of 2013, uh, you can see that uh, most of the school systems uh, do not uh, allow uh, the use of devices that students have during class time. This is some data from last year's Speak Up uh, by Project Tomorrow. Uh, they asked students, uh, how many of you have uh, uh, devices? And you can see that um, even a higher end mobile device like a smartphone, uh, half of uh, high school students have, the, have that. And if you look at tablets, which of course didn't even exist uh, three to four years ago, 26% uh, of middle school students already have those. That doesn't mean that, that we have ubiquity with uh, smartphones and tablet, tablets, but uh, an awful lot of students do have them. And uh, in general, uh, school systems are banning them from being used.
And in fact, uh, the uh, Sesame Street's uh, Cooney Center did some survey of very small students, even before they get in school. And you see that uh, young children are often allowed to use an iPhone or an iTouch uh, f by parents that own them. So they come to school uh, being quite used to using uh, smartphones. So what this is stimulating in lots of districts around the United States, and I think around the world, uh, is in fact what we would call bring your own. Sometimes it's called bring your own technology or bring your own device. Uh, it certainly has been driven by cost savings, and one early adopter of that was uh, Forsyth County outside of uh, Atlanta. They uh, are a pretty affluent school district, but even they felt they couldn't afford a one-to-one -one environment. And so about four to five years ago, they started allowing their students uh, to bring their own devices. And the devices uh, range from uh, Sony Nintendo uh, game consoles in the young, in elementary school to laptops to, of course, these sort of smartphones and tablets. Um, but I think although uh, money has driven some of this conversation, um, when we ask uh, parents, teachers, and administrators why they're, uh, why they're excited about mobile learning, why they're allowing this, uh, they, they, it really comes down to these four big topics. Uh, it engages students more. It extends the learning beyond schools. It personal, allows you to personalize the learning, let, letting kids go at their own uh, pace, and of course allows access to online uh, resources and textbooks. Um, that's not to say that this is a slam dunk. It's not easy. There are uh, right and wrong ways to implement that. And when we ask what are the concerns of, uh, of adults, uh, teachers, administrators, and parents, uh, distraction. Uh, is the number one concern. <coughs> and by that, they mean um, the kids are not looking forward at the front of the class and listening to the teacher, but are off doing something else. Of course, uh, you know, if like today I'm talking about something and you're at your desk and I mention something you're interested in, you go on the internet to look that up, uh, is that really a distraction or is that in fact uh, deepening the uh, the, the learning. I also, the, be, the other big concern is cheating. And of course, it is cheating if some students have access to an internet enabled device and some don't. But uh, some countries, like Denmark, are in fact saying, you know, even their high stakes tests are now allowing students their open internet tests. You ask different kinds of questions, not factual, but more critical thinking. Uh, so I think uh, a great debate to have in your school systems is what is cheating. And of course, uh, the biggest concern, uh, or a bi very big concern of adults is that they don't understand how to use the mobiles uh, uh, for, for teaching and learning, and that's a, a big concern. Um, and of course, there are digital equity issues, as we've already pointed out. Not every student has a tablet or, or a an iPad, so you do have to think about those. Uh, you have to think about safety and liability if students are carrying uh, valuable devices with them back and forth. Uh, a huge concern is bandwidth, and we'll be talking about that a little bit more. Uh, at the moment that you go, to, I would argue that uh, almost every school and school district in the United States is already a bring your own device environment. Uh, some acknowledge it, the others, the students are just doing it, but it's having a, an enormous impact on bandwidth. And of course, it would have an enormous impact on tech support if you're going to support devices that students bring. That is not typical uh, in most school systems. It's typically the technical support is then the responsibility of the students or parents for the devices that they bring. Um, we just released, a, a COSIN just released a new administrator's guide to mobile learning, which is a rich uh, resource built in a wiki environment that you might want to explore uh, through our, our website. Uh, it starts with an infographic that talks about the steps that you should go through as you uh, think about uh, uh, these sort of bring your own device strategies.
But if done right, I think it's an enormous opportunity. Uh, literally overnight, we could go from uh, an environment where we have a device for every four students to really a ubiquitous environment. And that's a huge opportunity. But just because we have it at school doesn't necessarily mean we have it at home. This is another big, hairy problem, that it depends, in fact, by family income whether or not you have broadband at home. This chart shows that for families of under $30,000 income, uh, only a little over 40% of families have broadband, whereas if you go to families with over $75,000 income, uh, it goes to well over 80%. So we have challenges, and learning, of course, doesn't just happen at school. Some places around the world are, in fact, investing in one-to-one uh, -one environments to reach all families. Uh, in uh, Uruguay, for the last four years, they've had Plan Sabal. Uh, they've de they've uh, released devices to every student in grades one through nine. They also have hotspots anywhere you are in Uruguay uh, within a six block radius. You can um, use your device to get on the education network. And uh, this is the kind of big, bold thinking that we're starting to see in places like Uruguay, Portugal, Argentina, and many other countries in South America. Um, and uh, the interesting thing, I think, is that this is viewed not just as an education technology program, but in fact a social inclusion program, one that reaches into families. And in fact, in Uruguay, those devices at night are also used uh, for, for mothers to learn about uh, nutrition programs. So it's uh, you know, a much more uh, comprehensive sort of approach to technology in schools than how we sometimes talk about this in the United States. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't places in the United States that are doing it. In fact, uh, we just did our national conference. Uh, San Diego has a very major uh, project uh, that uh, brings one-to-one -one environments and allows kids to bring devices home. Uh, there also are some new market-driven initiatives. Uh, this is the cable industry is just launching. They've been testing it out in something like 10 communities. And starting this spring and fall will be the new Connect to Compete. Uh, initiative. This is for families that are school lunch eligible. Uh, you can go to any cable company, uh, and uh, those families are eligible for a $9.95 per month uh, broadband. They also provide low uh, cost computers, about $150 for a device, and they provide digital literacy skills. Um, so this is a market-driven uh, way to solve a piece of the puzzle. I would argue it is not the whole puzzle because there are still families that can't afford $9.95 a month, but there are many more who can afford $9.95 than can afford the, the typical uh, rates of 40 or $50 that broadband is uh, in many communities. But I said that we were also going to talk about the bigger, uh, hairier problem. And that, in fact, is human. It's us. Uh, I think of the old uh, Pogo cartoon. I've seen uh, the enemy, and it is me. And um, uh, by that, I think we, we all, as educators, need to be thinking about what are the new skills that we need. And so um, cosin has been doing a lot of thinking about what is the role of superintendents? Uh, what do they need to do differently to help us shift from really a print to a digital world? And what's their role? They're not uh, in charge of technology, but they're in charge of the overall system. And uh, we've spent quite a bit of time partnering with superintendent associations and doing focus groups and talking to superintendents. What is and I think rather than talking about what's the, the technology, we've we found a lot of res, res, resonance when we start talking about what's the key educational problems that superintendents are trying to solve. And these five uh, topics are the sorts of things that, that we hear. First of all, they want to make sure that 
that students are prepared for the 21st century, that they, they certainly they need the basics of reading and writing and, and math, but they also need new, new uh, uh, skills like collaboration, creativity, um, coll uh, the, the big C's that the Partnership for 21st Century Skills talks about. They also uh, want to make sure that uh, learning environments are much more compelling. Uh, we have a huge dropout program. How do we make sure that uh, kids want to stay in a learning environment? And even for those kids that do stay in, we're finding that the longer that kids are in the current environment, the current uh, educational system in many classrooms, especially as they get to, to middle school and certainly by high school, they're bored. So how do we engage them to, be, to really be compelling learning environments? Um, superintendents also said they want to change professional development, making sure that, that it's uh, mo not just a top-down, uh, you know, after-school uh, environment, uh, solutions, but in fact, uh, 24 by 7, that uh, when a teacher or administrator needs information, they can find it. They also want to use data to inform uh, their decision making as superintendents. And finally, if superintendents were only to pick one particular um, uh, problem that they're trying to solve, they want to get to much more balanced sorts of assessments. Um, I'm seeing that a lot of people are starting to have uh, bandwidth problems, so I'm going to switch off my video uh, to help you uh, with that. Um, so if these are the uh, educational problems that we're trying to solve, um, these are not inherently technology problems. However, I would argue that as folks on the on this uh, webinar who are interested in technology, the way we need to think about our educational technology is solving these sort of problems. So if we want to talk about uh, 21st century skills, it's pretty clear that the, all the sort of collaborative and web 2.0 sorts of tools really enable th that much more collaborative sort of learning. If we want to talk about more compelling environments, look at what engages kids, and you can see with their mobile devices and their social networking how they uh, uh, become engaged outside of school. If we want to do professional development that's much more uh, 24 by 7, using technology with online communities of practice. If we want to use data to inform instruction, then um, uh, technology really enables that kind of and not just for high stakes accountability, but to really inform uh, practice. And of course, balanced assessments for getting much more of that formative data to the teacher and the learner. Um, that's all possible with technology. We also think, though, that, that uh, technology leaders have new skills that they need. And COSIN's done a lot of work around this. Many of you may be familiar with the ISTE uh, net standards uh, for teachers and students and, and, and administrators. Um, the COSIN framework of essential skills is for people who are in charge of technology uh, at, a dis at a school system level, and we encourage you to, to look it up and see what those skills are at COSIN.org uh, backslash framework. We've also, over the past year, just launched a new uh, national certification in the United States that enables uh, high-performing uh, uh, school system leaders to become certified. It's a, a, a rigorous uh, certification, and I encourage you to look at that. We think that um, you know, 20 years ago, the job of the technology leader uh, at a school district, and really that was the case for CIOs in every industry sector, was primarily technical. It was about 80% of their job, according to PricewaterhouseCoopers. It's now about 20% of their job. It's much more important that uh, they have that they understand the educational environment, that they have the leadership and vision skills. Yes, you still have to manage the technology and support services, but um, all of that is is critical. Um, I thought it might be useful to mention uh, 
uh, two weeks ago at our national conference, we released a new national survey, our first ever, of district technology leaders. And we asked them, what are your top three priorities and initiatives for this year? And the number one uh, priority is, in fact, uh, bring your own device strategies, which I was just talking about. And fast on the horizon is getting ready for those 2014, 2015 uh, uh, common core state assessments that are going to be delivered via technology. And both of those uh, top two priorities are driving the need to increase broadband uh, within our school systems. So that gives you kind of a snapshot of the things that school district leaders are talking about. And when we ask them what are the major challenges facing uh, uh, district leaders. Uh, the first, of course, was budget and resources. Uh, that was the overwhelming choice. Uh, that's not surprising. 80% uh, of uh, district leaders reported a flat or declining budget. Uh, that 80%, 20% said they had a declining budget for the coming year. Um, related that, although you know, also very high was, in fact, just changing the culture of teaching to a much more student-centered learning environment, uh, with 66% saying that that was their, a major challenge. And uh, the other major challenge that uh, is how do we kind of break down the silos? How do we help curriculum and technology and finance and all of the different uh, divisions within uh, a school system to work together. Um, as we think about this human capacity, we really need to think not o we need to think about a whole variety of new things. For instance, what are the new learning models that that happen? How do we become uh, more focused on students so that they, in fact, are the ultimate customer of of our school systems? How do we provide more of that? Uh, continuous feedback to both the learner and the teacher that enables a much more personalized learning environment. One of the places that's uh, very interesting is the Quest to Learn School in New York. Uh, they also have one in Chicago, uh, supported by the MacArthur Foundation. It's uh, based on g a game-based theory, where kids become designers. That's the kind of innovative example uh, that we, I think we're we're going to need to to do if we really want to powerfully think about how technology can enable a much more personalized learning environment. We also need to think about new partnerships. Uh, we need to bridge both formal and informal. Uh, and uh, we were recently in Chicago to see the work that the New York that the Chicago Public Library is doing uh, through the U Media, where uh, probably a public library in most cities, including Chicago, would, would not typically be the place where students in high school or middle school would go after, after school. But in fact, because they've created a, a dynamic environment where kids can uh, really uh, use technology to create uh, uh, digital literacy programs, it's really become a hub for innovation. We also, this means that we're going to have to spend the monies that we currently have in different ways. Uh, you saw that uh, the number one challenge facing our school systems in the United States is money. Uh, unfortunately, Santa Claus isn't going to be coming down the chimney with new monies for many of our school systems. So we need to think about how do we spend money differently, spending it less on textbooks, more on digital content, more on broadband. That means, uh, and if you're interested in the, kind of how do you show the value of investment for technology, you might want to explore that resource. We also need new policies. Um, and we just uh, two weeks ago released our a, a second version of our Rethinking Acceptable Use Policies to Enable Digital Learning. It's free and downloadable. 
And last year we did one uh, with 14, I'm sorry, 20 national associations called Rethinking State and School District Policies Concerning Mobile Technologies and Social Media. Both of those can be downloaded off of the COSIN website. And of those 20 national associations, and it was everyone from the teachers and uh, union, the school boards, the, the, the principal associations, COSIN, uh, a whole, whole variety of different organizations, these were the five uh, or the four themes that they said. First of all, banning technology is not the answer. Secondly, we need to educate students on responsible use. We need to emphasize professional development on safe and effective use. And we need to rethink and revise our acceptable use policies, moving them to more of responsible use. So the question I have is, you know, are we really ready? And I want to get to uh, an answer some of the questions. So I hope in your chat box that you're presenting some questions. I encourage each of you to uh, think about reading Tom Friedman's uh, book. It came out about a year and a half ago called That Used to Be Us. And his point is that, uh, you know, really up after per, uh, much of the 20th century, it was the United States that set the pace, doing big scale innovation. Yet today, we tend to do things really small. Uh, we we tend to test them out in a in a particular in the United, in the education in a classroom or at a school. But how do we get to scalability? And um, you know, when you look at places like Uruguay, that you know are deploying on a one to one basis, ubiquity and access. You know, when will we ever get to that in the United States? And how do we get our policymakers to think about uh, technology in a much more transformative and powerful way? So um, I always like to say we have to have to not be afraid, but we have to uh, like that cat jump into the water. So I want to um, uh, start looking at some of your questions, and um, uh, let's just see. Um, and I don't have a moderator, so I'm trying to read the uh, questions as fast as I can. Ethan, Derek, and I can help you. Um, OK. Anything you want me to particularly focus on? Looks like some folks have already visited Forsyth County, and we're at the they're Breaking the Barriers conference. There's a long question um, here. OK. Well, first, Mark Gillingham says, how would you compare COSIN with, COSIN with ISTE on information framework and certification? Well, I, I think the IS, we see it as an outgrowth of the sort of effort that the NETS uh, provide for teachers and students and administrators. And by administrators, they typically mean um, superintendents and principals and, and people like that. Our, certifi our uh, framework is specifically for uh, district uh, uh, technology leaders. We generically call them chief technology officers. They could have a variety of different titles, director of technology or coordinator of technology. We are increasingly seeing the title of chief technology officer. In fact, our um, new survey uh, that went to district leaders of technology, over 40% uh, indicated that they are using the title of uh, Chief Technology Officer or CIO. So that's interesting because a decade ago that term really wasn't used uh, until COSIN started talking about it in the in the K-12 environment. Um, I think you're also asking the question about um, certification. Certification, uh, if you think of a uh, in the accounting area, the highest level of uh, of achievement is to become a CPA. And a person sit for an exam, and then every certain number of years, in this case, every three years, you need to be recertified uh, with continuing education points. Or you could take the exam again. Um, so we have had over uh, 100 persons take the national certification from COSIN. It's called the CETL. 
Certified Education Technology Leader. And if you pass that, you get to put uh, CETL after your name. Uh, over uh, 63, well, 63 people as of this day have passed the exam, so you can see it is rigorous. Um, it is aspirational. Uh, you have to have been in the field several, a number of years in order to qualify for it. And we would encourage you, if you are a district leader, to, uh, to do this. We think it, uh, we also are encouraging superintendents and heads of HR to um, look, you know, advertise it as a preference. Uh, hopefully at some point it will actually become a requirement. Uh, we see it as a career growth, uh, uh, helping people who probably have a lot of skills if they're currently in the job, but may have other areas that they need to strengthen. So this gives you an overall sense of sort of the professional development that you need. Keith, there's a nice long question here. Uh, it goes as follows. Uh -huh. The scariest aspect of this is that it must fundamentally change the ways adults relate to children. Authority and expertise are no longer the norm. So how do teachers become more transparent about their own thinking and decision-making process to foster student independence? I mean, I think this is absolutely at the, the fundamental core of, of everything that, that uh, we believe here at COSIN. And this, we are not just talking about the technology. We're talking about a cultural shift. And this is hard work and not easy. It's not easy in any industry sector. But it's particularly challenging in K-12, where we have a culturally conservative uh, uh, organization. Um, I, I don't mean that politically, but I mean that in the sense that, um, you know, we are dealing with, uh, we are uh, stewards of, of, of kids and we have to be uh, careful about what we do. But, um, you know, it's, the whole uh, environment um, is set up in an industrial context. It's, it's interesting. Um, Prior to the Industrial Revolution, if you look back at you know what the sort of Socratic method was, or what learning looked like in medieval times, or even up up through it, in fact, was much more individualized, much more personalized. That's what a great education was. You you uh, maybe came together for some conversation with a professor, but you also uh, did your own independent, and you moved at your own pace. You had your own uh, 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 interests and so it's much more of a renaissance of learning and going back to what learning really meant and I, th I think that's a challenge because we, we do want certain basics for everyone to learn but we also want uh, learners to go deeper faster um, and uh, find their own passion and uh, with technology, I think we have a real opportunity to, on a large scale, to go much more uh, to a renaissance in education. I don't know if I fully answered the question, but, but it, it, this cultural shift is um, really going to be the, the, the heart and, and, and challenge for education uh, now and in the future. So if you have a question for Keith, you can raise your virtual hand. That's the third icon of in the participant box, or you can put it in the chat. Keith, is there an inherent dilemma here? Meaning, uh, when you talk about that sort of renaissance era learning, um, are there institutional, are there vested institutional interests that drive education now that will make it hard to get to that kind of learning? Yeah, um, uh, I think there's all kinds of institutional. The way we, the way we fund education, the way we, um, uh, the institutions that we have. Uh, you know, we're, what we're asking is no different than um, when the automobile was was created uh, and started to appear. You know, railroads had to uh, think through. You know, how they were going to uh, handle passengers, and some did it and some didn't, and um, it's a huge challenge. Uh, I also, I, I just think within my lifetime of when I was in school, um, the whole mindset was around scarcity. Um, it was what 
the teacher knew what was in the textbook, what was in the library down the hall, what was on the globe that was 10 years old, or the Encyclopedia Britannica that was equally as old. Um, once we brought the internet into the classroom, scarcity is, was no longer the challenge of education. And in fact, it's not the challenge. You know, I, I remember uh, growing up, a huge amount of time was spent, you know, learning how to research things and find uh, resources. The, the challenge now isn't finding information. The challenge is there's too much information. And how do you make sense of it? And how do you order it? And how, what's the digital literacy that you have that, that takes that abundance of information and puts it in context to make uh, smart decisions based on good information that's reliable. And so th it's, it's a huge societal change uh, for education to go from a scarcity model to uh, a, a problem where, where there's too much information. And for the last couple of hundred years, we're, we're, especially with Uli, we're used to this idea that uh, governments institute schools for the purpose of accomplishing a social policy, whereas learning can often be directed toward the opposite. Does that create some dilemmas? Yeah, and I, I think uh, John Seeley Brown and others have, have done a lot of great work on, you know, kind of looking at, we've tended to think that Edu that learning equals education, and, and that is what happens at school. But in fact, it's it, it has always been the case that a lot of learning happens outside of school. And wouldn't it be great if we could actually connect uh, and, and use the the time that students have outside of school to pursue their passions, but also to pursue learning in the bigger context. And, um, you know, I think that that's why it's so important. You know, the, the big idea of the E-rate back in the mid-1990s was that every classroom needed to be connected to the internet, not just every school. You didn't just need a connection into the principal's office, but the technology had to get into every classroom. And, and we've made, that's made a huge difference in the United States. Um, you know, we, we don't necessarily have broadband everywhere, but we do have connectivity almost in every classroom. The challenge is if you, we need to uh, we can't just have two or three devices sitting in the back of a, of a classroom and expect that that's going to change the way that we do teaching and learning. Um, you know, I like to say if if I had three or four other people surrounded around my smartphone or my tablet or my personal computer, I would use it in completely different ways than if I had uh, than if everyone had their own device. A and um, that of course, raises the next question, which I talked about earlier, which is uh, the technology can't just uh, connect to the school, but we actually want kids to do homework. We want them to be connected, uh, uh, whether they're on the school bus or whether they're at the Starbucks. How do they access good content and work on the, the their learning, uh, both formal and informal? And so um, this is going to take a whole lot of new partnerships. And since school systems aren't likely to get a lot of new money, we're going to have to figure out how do we tap into innovative ways to get um, homes and communities and poor families connected. We're on the closing minutes of uh, hearing from Keith Kruger. If you've got a question, you can put it in the chat, or you can raise your virtual hand. There's the third icon over in the participant window. Keith Rowland wants to know, a question came up in another room about when COSIN releases the BYOD report. I'm not exactly sure. I mean, we, we have a lot of resources up uh, on our website. Uh, I, I mentioned the Administrator's Guide to Mobile Technology. Uh, if you go to our Leadership for Mobile Learning initiative, which is COSIN.org backslash uh, mobile lead, I think is the sh short URL, you'll see all kinds of resources and case studies and checklists and things like that that are available. Um, I think 
that would be where I would start. Uh, I mentioned in my slide deck uh, some of the other resources on rethinking policies for acceptable use. Um, I don't know, it seems like we're releasing things. Uh, if you're a COSIN member, uh, you get uh, what we call our EdTech Action, I'm sorry, our EdTech Next reports, which are uh, free uh, for members um, emerging technology reports. And we've put out a number of uh, how, to, how to actually manage multiple devices, because it's, it's not an easy technical challenge to have kids on a lot of different platforms. And how do you think about that? Good. There's probably time for one or two more questions, if you have them. Uh, Roland's follow-up was wondering if those reports are annual, and I'm not sure. You may have said that, and I just missed it. But um, yeah. um, we're we're putting out things constantly. So uh, the the newest thing again from COSIN is the administrator's guide, and uh, this is the first uh, resource we've issued in kind of a wiki environment. It is a closed and moderated wiki, but um, as you as a if you visited uh, that uh, uh, administrator's guide, you can suggest additional resources and we'll be constantly uh, updating it. And it's really a, a very, very comprehensive uh, resource that uh, Lucy Gray and, and a bunch of other key volunteers have pulled together kind of leading practices around uh, mobile technology. Great. So if you have a question for Keith, you can put it in the chat or raise your virtual hand. Well, I, I have I probably stumped everyone, but uh, I, I hope that people will really, you know, start to think about what is it that uh, we as uh, leaders need to do differently. And um, frankly, uh, for those of us in charge of technology, uh, we need to talk about what the what the learning looks like, not, and then go to uh, what the new uh, device or solution is. And um, you know, I think that that uh, too often, you, you know, an easy way to get people to show up to is to start talking about uh, what the latest new gizmo is. But uh, that's not the way to kind of frame it in, for our parents, for our superintendents, and our school boards. We need to talk about what the actual learning looks like. So thanks uh, very much for, for being here today. And uh, if anyone wants to reach me, please email me at keith at And uh, have a great day. And I hope you're getting lots of exciting uh, things as part of the Leadership Summit. Take care. Thanks, Keith. Thanks, Keith. So Thank appreciate you. your participation. Thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm going to turn the recording off. We do have another set of sessions.